This video will almost certainly be demonetized, so a special thank you to our Patreon backers who help to fund the channel. Join them and support independent, non-partisan reporting by clicking the link below. It was six weeks ago, at 3am local time on Friday June 2nd, that the US left Afghanistan, abandoning their military city at Bagram Air Base and returning home. 45 days later and things have gone downhill fast, with the Taliban quickly regaining territory and the country's government seemingly unable to resist. So in this video we're going to be taking a look at the crucial maps which explain the last week and discuss how the Taliban were able to take over so quickly. It might have only been six weeks since the US left Afghanistan, but it's been about 20 years since they first entered, which also means that it's been decades since the Taliban had complete control over the country. However, it looks like they may have achieved it once again. So first, let's take a look at some of the maps and see what's changed. This map, based on a BBC audit, showed how things looked when the study was conducted in 2017. The blue areas are under clear government control, while the red ones are under Taliban control. At the time, 15 million people, around half of the population, were in areas either controlled by the Taliban or where the Taliban were openly present. Things had shifted by July of this year though, when the map looked more like this, with the yellow areas showing disputed territory. As you can see clearer right here, contested areas make up a plurality of districts, but the government still controlled 141 to the Taliban's 90. If we transition this map from just over a month ago to yesterday, you can see a significant and horrifying shift, an absolute Taliban takeover, with even the final government anti-Taliban areas dominated over the weekend. These red areas are as bad as they look too, as districts are only coloured red if their administrative centres, police headquarters and other government institutions are all in Taliban control. Anything less than this total control and they'll be coloured yellow. So yes, the red areas are truly Taliban dominated. It's not just about landmass either. The Taliban also control all major border crossings in and out of the country, which means, as of the time of writing, Kabul airport is the only official route out of the country, with the US being forced to intervene to support this. This not only gives the Taliban control over who goes in and out, but also gives them the ability to control the goods travelling through the borders, with the reported potential to generate $20 million a month from customs duties and bribes. This is clearly a startling change, from July to just over a month later. So what happened? How did we reach this horrifying point? Well, the Taliban may have been suppressed under US and international occupation, but they never even nearly disappeared. Remember that even in the 2017 map we showed you, back then half the population lived in areas where the Taliban had some or total control. So when the international community began to slowly and then suddenly step back, their estimated 60,000 fighters stepped up. Seeing a power vacuum emerge, Taliban fighters snatched the opportunity, gaining momentum and overpowering the government. This momentum was clearly important, with the government simply handing over control of some regions, knowing that they'd have no hope of defending them. This shouldn't be the case, at least on paper. The Taliban might have 60,000 fighters, but the Afghans have some 300,000, including the likes of the army, air force and police. And as we mentioned, the Afghans weren't exactly unprepared. The US and NATO more generally have spent billions training them up and trying to equip them for situations like this. In fact, US and British generals were regularly praised for building a new, more powerful Afghan army. Praise which looks pretty dubious today. The major issue for them though was this 300,000 number. The country has always struggled to actually meet and maintain this size of force, with high casualty rates, many desertions due to postings miles from home, and the major issue of corruption. This final problem has seen many so-called ghost soldiers emerge, whereby generals claimed the salaries of soldiers who never really existed. In fact, a recent report from the US Congress highlights how big this issue is. If the Afghans have a problem with their 300,000 number, then the Taliban might have the reverse. 
The official estimates might put their fighting force at about 60,000, but it could be a lot higher, potentially as high as 200,000, when you factor in supporting and affiliated groups. In the words of an expert in the area, the Taliban is closer to a coalition of independent franchise holders, loosely and most probably temporarily affiliated with one another. So measuring and assessing their members has always been difficult. But it's not just people though. Money, weapons and technology also play a factor. A factor that should, again, help the Afghans. After all, the US alone poured $88 billion into Afghan security, salaries and, most importantly, weapons. This clearly should have given the Afghans a huge head start. And it certainly did, with the Taliban struggling to fight back against the country's air force. But over time, the Taliban themselves seem to have strengthened too. This is in part due to the Taliban's wealth, much of which was earned through drug trafficking, but they also benefited from seizing weapons and vehicles from defecting Afghan troops, only boosting their reserves and their power. This power has seemingly been enough because over the last month, the Taliban have come back strong and taken over, either by force or by government forces simply overwhelmed, demoralized and handing over control. The last major fight appeared to be in Kabul, the nation's capital and naturally a government stronghold. The Taliban initially said that they wouldn't invade the city while a transitional government was being set up. But with Afghan police abandoning their post, the Taliban claimed that they were forced to take control of the city, facing almost no resistance as the capital fell into chaos and the country's prime minister fled. The prime minister wasn't the only one either, with harrowing footage from the city's airport showing people's desperate attempts to get out. Either way, they appear to have completely dominated the country in little over a week, and according to Taliban officials, they expect a peaceful handover of the country from the government to themselves within the next few days. There's clearly a lot to unpick here. What does the future look like for the country? Can anything be done now, or would retaliation from the US and international community be futile? Did Biden make the wrong call when pulling out troops? And were billions of dollars wasted and countless lives lost for nothing? As the days play out, we want to answer those questions for you. So please use the form linked below to add your questions to our list so that we can explain what's going on. Ultimately, that's all we have time for in this video, but be sure to subscribe for updates as this situation plays out. And tomorrow, we're set to release a full video outlining the Taliban, their ideology, their history, and their future. So be sure to ring the bell to be notified when that video is released. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram if you want to take a better look at the maps we shared today, and be sure to share them with your friends. This video was made possible due to our Patreon backers. You too can back us on Patreon and see your name at the end of videos by clicking the link in the description.